pleasure to welcome Naomi Oreskes back to our campus. And she was at UCSD for a number of years and visiting here at Scripps as well for part of that. Um, Naomi Oreskes is a singularly impressive individual starting with a PhD in geoscience, experience in industry, and then becoming a world-renowned historian of science. Um, she has been recognized with medals from the American Geophysical Union for the Citation for Science and Society in 2014. In 2015, she received the Public Service Award of the Geological Society of America and also the Herbert Face Prize of the American Historical Association. So a very wide range of impressive awards. I am sorry to say that she's no longer at UCSD, but in fact at some other institution in the East. Um, but we're happy to welcome her back here. And without further delay, Naomi. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Lynn was supposed to say that I teach at a little college in the East, <laughs> a little old college. Um, anyway, it's really a pleasure to be back. Uh, it's a pleasure to be home. It's great to be here, and I, I'm really happy to have this opportunity to see so many familiar faces. Um, I know a lot of you know a lot about my work. Many of you have heard me speak before, but there are also a lot of people here who haven't. And so what I'm going to try to do today is the first half of the talk is work that I've been working on for the past decade that some of you will have heard about before based on the book I wrote with Eric Conway, who will be here tomorrow teaching the master's students, um, Merchants of Doubt. And then the second half of the talk, presenting some new work I've been doing based in part on the meeting at the Vatican that some of the folks here and I attended a year and a half ago, uh, in which I am starting to try to develop a kind of framework for thinking about the question of the relationship between science and policy and the role that scientists should or should not play in terms of engaging with public policy issues. And I'm hoping that the second half of the talk maybe will launch a vigorous uh, discussion, because I think this is an issue close to the hearts of many people here, and obviously extremely relevant for the new um, master's program in science and policy. So without further ado, as many of you know, the United States is a signatory to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which was uh, passed by world leaders in 1992. The UN Framework Convention permits commits the world to preventing so-called DAI, or dangerous anthropogenic interference in the climate system. What many Americans don't know or seem to have forgotten is that when President George Bush signed the Framework Convention, he called on world leaders to translate the written document into concrete action to protect the planet. But as we all also know, here we are 23, now 24 years later, we know that that didn't happen. We know from the work of people here at Scripps and around the world that dangerous anthropogenic interference in the climate system is underway. So how did we get to this state of affairs? What I want to start with is for those of you who aren't familiar with my work to just go back and talk a little bit about a kind of really brief history of climate science and how we got to the point of understanding in 1992 that climate change represented a threat. Um, and that story really begins with the work of John Tyndall the Irish experimentalist who in the 1850s, more than 150 years ago, established the idea of a greenhouse gas and demonstrated through a set of clever experiments that carbon dioxide and water both had the important and distinctive property of being relatively transparent to visible light, but relatively opaque to infrared, and therefore played a very major role in warming the climate of the Earth and making the Earth hospitable for life. So Tyndall essentially saw the greenhouse effect as a good thing that made planet Earth habitable. I feel horrible seeing all these people standing. There are a couple of seats here if anybody wants to squeeze in. Um, otherwise, I can see your beautiful faces. OK. Now, the first person to suggest uh, that burning fossil fuels could change the Earth's climate was Svante Arrhenius, the Swedish geochemist. And I always like to tell graduate students about Arrhenius because he, he's very reassuring to me because he failed his PhD exams and had a nervous breakdown and then went on to have an illustrious and brilliant scientific career. Don't get any ideas. <laughs> it's always, just to say, there's always hope. 
So Arrhenius did the first quantitative calculations of what the effect of doubling carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere would be, and came up with a climate sensitivity of 1.5 to 4.5 degrees C, a figure that still more or less holds today. Now Arrhenius was Swedish, so he thought that global warming would be a good thing. <laughs> the first person to suggest that it might be a bad thing was the British steam engineer Guy Stewart Callender. In fact, in 1938, Callender published the first article in a peer-reviewed journal suggesting that carbon dioxide was already increasing the atmosphere and the temperature might be increasing too. Now that was in 1938, the following year war broke out in Europe and that interfered with a lot of scientific work, including work on what came to be known as the Callender Effect. But in the 1950s, the issue was raised again by a number of scientists, including famously Roger Revelle and Hans Seuss here at Scripps. In an article in TELUS published in 1957, Revelle and Scripps wrote famously that mankind was performing a great geophysical experiment. Now one of the things that Revelle was quite interested in was the question of if we burn fossil fuels and put CO2 into the atmosphere, where does that CO2 go? Revelle was a chemical oceanographer and geologist by training and he knew that one possibility was that a lot of that CO2 could be taken up by the oceans or the biosphere. And so he posed the question, can we measure atmospheric CO2 in the atmosphere and use that to determine whether or not the CO2 is staying in the atmosphere or being absorbed by the oceans and the biosphere? And as most of you know, that question became the impetus for the life's work of Charles David Keeling, who spent most of his career here at Scripps uh, measuring carbon dioxide and producing what we now know today as the Keeling curve. So Dave Killing began measuring carbon dioxide in 1958 as part of the Inter Ge International Geophysical Year and continued that work until his death just a few years ago. Now an interesting thing about Dave Killing's work is that by 1965, Dave, Ravel, and others had already concluded that the data were sufficient to show that carbon dioxide was in fact increasing and that about half of the CO2 was remaining in the atmosphere and the other half being taken up by the oceans or the biosphere. And as a result of that insight, Ravel Killing and a number of other scientists wrote a report for the President's Science Advisory Committee in which they said, quote, by the year 2000 there will be about 25% more CO2 in our atmosphere than at present, and this will modify the heat balance of the atmosphere to such an extent that market changes in climate could occur. And that prediction, as we know, of course, has come true. Now scientists often complain that politicians don't pay attention to what we do, but in 1965 at least one politician did because President Lyndon Johnson spoke about it in a special message to Congress in which he wrote, this generation has altered the composition of the atmosphere on a global scale through a steady increase in carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuels. So Lyndon Johnson and other political leaders already knew about the potential threat of climate change from CO2 in 1965. But admittedly, in 1965, President Johnson had a few other things to worry about, like a war that wasn't going well in Vietnam, and civil rights workers who were being killed in Mississippi. So there wasn't a lot of serious interest generated in policy circles. Although there was some, and I'm actually doing some research now on the Clean Air Act, showing how Dave's work and the work of um, John Tukey and other scientists actually led to the inclusion of weather and climate in the Clean Air Act. So actually, there's, it's actually a kind of success story about science and policy, and maybe if you invite me back next year, I'll have finished writing that up and, and I can give that talk. What we do know happened here, though, a crucial additional scientific component was the rise of numerical simulation modeling in the late 60s and 70s. The development of fast digital computers made it possible for the first time to build general circulation mod models to study the Earth's climate as a system and to revisit what scientists called the calendar question. That is to say, would the increase in carbon dioxide lead to a general warming of the planet? And this then in turn triggered a rather serious discussion of the issue in policy circles in the 1970s. A number of reports were written, including a major report by the National Research Council, chaired by Robert White, the first head of NOAA in 1977, a report by the Jason Committee for the Department of Energy in 79, and a report that many people here know about, the so-called Charney Report, led by meteorologist Jewel Charney in 1979 for the U.S. National Research Council. In fact, there were so many studies done in the 1970s that the National Academy in a press release said in 1979 that a plethora of studies from diverse sources indicates a consensus 
that climate changes will result from man's combustion of fossil fuels and changes in land use. So what we see that in 1979 there was already a scientific consensus that warming would happen, and there was also a consensus that when it did happen it would matter, that it would not be insignificant. And so the NRC continued, the close linkage between man's welfare and the climatic regime within which his society has evolved suggests that such climatic changes would have profound impacts on human society. The big question about which there was not yet consensus was when. So in the 1970s, all of these reports are written in the form of a prediction about something that is expected to occur. Most scientists who wrote about this in the 1960s and 70s did not think that detectable climate changes would happen before the start of the 21st century. So it was a surprising result, indeed a result that some people questioned, when in 1988, Climate modeler James Hansen and his team at NASA concluded that the anthropogenic fingerprint, the human signal in the climate system, had in fact been detected. And Hansen de testified to this in the US Congress in the summer of 1988, where he declared that he was 99% certain that human-caused climate change was underway. This result was so important and significant that it was reported on the front page of the New York Times. Global warming has begun, expert tells Senate. Sharp cut in burning of fossil fuels is urged to, ba ba to battle shift in climate. And indeed, the New York Times concluded, the issue of an overheating world has suddenly moved to the forefront of public concern. And notice the headline, not global warming discovered, as some people have called it, but global warming has begun. A prediction that scientists had made, going back to the 1950s or even earlier, that was now coming true. Indeed, this received so much attention that it led several members of Congress to introduce a potential bill, the U.S. National Energy Policy Act, to reduce, to establish, <coughs> excuse me, to establish a national energy policy to reduce the generation of carbon and trace dioxide and trace gases as quickly as is feasible in order to slow the pace and degree of atmospheric warming. Uh, Roger Revelle corresponded with the uh, architects of this, and one of the things I think that's great about sometimes the details you find in the archive make you actually feel better about politics. If you notice, it doesn't just say carbon dioxide. Ray Weiss, you see it says carbon dioxide and trace gases. <laughs> so they actually understood even then that there were other gases as well that mattered, uh, but somehow that got lost from a lot of the public conversation as well. So what happened? You can see from this brief summary that there is already by 1988 very rich, very substantive, and what we could say in hindsight, very accurate science about this question. We see public attention. We even see a bill being introduced into Congress to address it. But then something goes wrong. So, so what happened? And the short answer to that question is that as the scientific consensus was emerging and gaining media and political attention, a campaign was also undertaken to challenge and undermine the science and to prevent the policy action that the, clim that the science suggested was needed. That is to say, what the New York Times said and what the National Energy Policy Act said to establish a policy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to prevent the U.S. from developing, uh, well, as I said, a national energy policy to reduce carbon dioxide as quickly as feasible. So what was this campaign and how did it work? The crux of the matter was to sow doubt about the science and to make the public and political leaders think that we didn't really know whether or not this was a real problem and therefore that action would be premature. So I just want to play here a small clip. Hopefully this will work. I was having, oh no. <sighs> okay, we just went through a whole thing to get this to work. Let me do, I, I really want to show this clip. So let me see if I can get out of PowerPoint. It will be slightly awkward, but I should be able to do this and show you the clip because it's kind of, I could explain it to you, but the film clip does it in about a second and it's so much more. Okay, here we go. So here's a film clip. This is Bill O'Keefe. Some of you may have heard of him. Bill O'Keefe worked for the American Petroleum Institute. He was a lobbyist for ExxonMobil, and he played a major role during the 1990s and 2000s in challenging the scientific evidence and, and supporting this idea that the science was too unsettled for action. Microphone. Make sure I'm talking to the microphone. Okay. Well, now I'm going to let Bill O'Keefe speak into the microphone. Okay, Bill here we go. O'Keefe is executive vice president of the American Petroleum Institute. He's also a 
automakers and others. We believe it was a war on oil. They had an off oil agenda. Climate change was part of that. I, I think that it's unfortunate that the science is so distorted in this state. And without the science is complicated, and there are lots of different factors, so you really have to understand the whole picture. There is a natural variability. This is the CEO of ExxonMobil. Climate is changing naturally. It has to do with sunspots. It has to do with the light. And so it's not too difficult to persuade some of the public that we really don't know for sure. So maybe let's wait a while. We need to have more. We need more data. The science isn't there to make that determination. There is no need for us to rush to this kind of judgment. There's others who put out ads saying more pollution is going to be good for us. A doubling of the CO2 trapped into the atmosphere will produce a tremendous greening of planet Earth. CO2 is the benefit of the planet. It's increasing the bounty and the productivity of the planet, our ability to feed populations in this world. What you're seeing here from the coal industry is, is perfectly analogous to what the tobacco industry is doing. They refuse to change, refuse to shift, and they're trying to convince us that it's actually good for us, the way uh, they used to say, uh, lucky is making healthy. Okay, so there is in a nutshell. So you have Jim Hansen, leading scientist, representing the scientific community, uh, but now you have a whole array of characters, the CEO of ExxonMobil, um, the CEO of uh, a, a major coal corporation, uh, and a lobbyist for ExxonMobil saying, well, we don't really know, there's a lot of things, science is complicated, there's sunspots, and oh my god, I'm getting a headache just thinking about how complicated it is. All right, so that's the merchants of doubt, that's the doubt mongering strategy in a nutshell. So let's go back to here and we can recover and continue. Good, all right, this has worked, okay. So that, as I said, was Bill O'Keefe. Um, and uh, the other people we saw, as I said, Lee Raymond, who was the CEO of ExxonMobil. Okay, so, so why would they say this? Why would they say the science is unclear, we don't really know, maybe it's sunspots? The, the short answer is because if the science wasn't settled, if we didn't really know, then clearly it would be illogical to give up things we like, like driving cars or spending, and it would be illogical to spend a lot of money on things we maybe didn't need, like renewable energy, so we could just go on using oil and gas and, and fossil fuels. So this, as John Pasacitano says in the film, and as we wrote about it length in our book, this is what we've called the tobacco strategy. And what we showed in our research was that the people who were challenging climate science had already honed this strategy working with the tobacco industry. In fact, in some cases, they were the exact same people, like that man, Bonner Cohen, who you see in the film clip, uh, he had previously worked um, for Philip Morris challenging the scientific evidence related to the harms of tobacco. Indeed, the strategy is almost exactly taken from the tobacco story. So in 1969, one tobacco executive wrote a memo that pretty much summed up the tobacco industry's strategy. He wrote, doubt is our product because it is the best means of competing with the body of fact that exists in the minds of the general public. This particular document was entered into evidence in the prosecution of the tobacco industry by the U.S. Department of Justice, under which the tobacco industry was found uh, responsible, found guilty for conspiracy to commit fraud against the American people. So what we showed in our work was that the same strategy, these same tactics, and in some cases the same people had worked together to undermine climate science. Much of this work in the early 1990s was done by a group called the Global Climate Coalition, and you saw in the film clip Bill O'Keefe was the head of the Global Climate Coalition in the 90s. Um, this was a coalition both of fossil fuel companies like ExxonMobil, Chevron, BP, Shell, also coal companies uh, like Peabody Coal, but also if you look closely on the left, you'll see a whole set of, sorry, I have to walk away from the um, automobile manufacturers, so BMW, Fiat, Honda, Hyundai, uh, Land Rover, Mazda, Mitsubishi, Nissan, Peugeot, Porsche, Rolls-Royce, virtually every major automobile um, company as well uh, participated in the Global Climate Coalition. And we have documents that tell us a lot about their strategy and tactics. Uh, one of the things that they were very clear about what they were trying to do was to push the idea of uncertainty in order to undermine the scientific challenges, undermine the scientific evidence. So this is one document from the American Petroleum Institute from 1998 that says, victory will be achieved when average citizens, quote, understand 
in scare quotes, recognize uncertainties in climate science, recognition of uncertainties becomes part of the conventional wisdom. And so one of the drumbeats of the doubt mongering campaign is the drumbeat of uncertainty, because if we all think it's uncertain, then we would think, well, how can we act on something that is so uncertain? In 1996, after the IPCC had come out with its second assessment report in which it stated that the balance of evidence suggests a discernible human influence on global climate, the Global Climate Coalition, Science and Technology Advisory Committee, argued in public that, quote, the IPC statement goes beyond what can be justified by current scientific knowledge. So if you have scientists telling you what they think scientific knowledge says, and then you have the Global Climate Coalition saying, that the scientists are saying things that can't be justified by science. So they're actually presenting themselves as the arbiter of science against actual scientists. Now one of the things that the industry knew was that the best way to sow doubt, the best people to sow doubt, the most convincing people were not industry executives. And lots of market research showed that if industry executives stood up in public and said, well, we don't really know, we're not really persuaded, most Americans would find that doubtful or dubious. But if they could find scientists <laughs> to say those things in public, then most of us would find that persuasive and convincing. And so sadly, one might even argue somewhat tragically, a key part of this strategy involved recruiting scientists to stand up in public and say, we don't believe it, we're not convinced, the science isn't settled. And so a big part of our research focused on a group of scientists who had played a major role in doubt-mongering campaigns um, by creating a think tank called the George C. Marshall Institute, which Bill O'Keefe later headed, um, to promote challenges to climate science but make them appear scientific. And the three key figures in creating the Marshall Institute were all prominent scientists, prominent physicists, many of whom are well known to people in this room. On the left, Robert Jastro, an astrophysicist who was the head of the Goddard Institute for Space Studies, ironically the man that hired Jim Hansen at NASA. In the middle, Frederick Seitz, who had been president of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences in the 1960s. And on the right, someone near and dear to all of us, Bill Nirenberg, um, as you mostly all know, the longtime director of this institution. In 1984, these men created the George C. Marshall Institute, initially to defend the Strategic Defense Initiative, but very quickly moving on to challenging the scientific evidence related to a host of environmental issues, of which climate change was arguably the most important, but not the only one. They also worked closely with another physicist, a man by the name of S. Fred Singer. Like the others, a Cold War physicist indeed, he was the proverbial rocket scientist. These physicists began the campaign to cast doubt on climate science in the late 1980s, using strategies and tactics that Frederick Seitz had learned by working as a consultant to the R.J. Reynolds tobacco industry. So just to sum up, how did this strategy work? To say that the science is unsettled, there was no, that there was no consensus. To emphasize the uncertainties, to insist that the uncertainties were so great, too great, to be sure that we would know what was going on. To emphasize other possible causes, to say there are lots of causes of the alleged phenomenon, sunspots, the wobble of the earth, and therefore we don't really know what the role of greenhouse gases is. And then, moving outside of the domain of science, to insist that fixing the problem would be too expensive, cost jobs, wreck the economy, and that fixing the problem would undermine our personal freedom and liberty. These messages were delivered through a variety of media. This included opinion pieces in newspapers and so-called advertorials, so advertisements taken out of newspapers but written to look as if they were editorials, press releases that would be sent to newspapers, magazines around the country, advertising campaigns, films and videos that were sent to school teachers and libraries around the country, and pseudo-scientific journals and reports, what I've called Potemkin Village Science, so reports that are written to look as if they're scientific, um, but are actually being issued by non-scientific think tanks. So I want to just show you an example of one advertising campaign that was run in the mid-1990s to try to undermine public support for the Kyoto Protocol to the UN Framework Convention. If the Earth is getting warmer, why is Kentucky getting colder? If the Earth is getting warmer, why is the frost line moving south? 
So either making claims that are simply false or taking things out of context, red herrings, uh, data from one place, as if that were somehow a refutation of all global climate data. Or here's another one, who told you the earth was warming, Chicken Little? So we're all just hysterical alarmists and extremists panicking about something that's not really happening. Some say the earth is warming, some also said the earth was flat. So we're not really scientists, we're just, you know, Luddites. And how much are you willing to pay to solve a problem that may not exist? So this advertising campaign was run in a whole series of um, sort of medium-sized city around the country. And when the ad campaign was run, the organizers of the campaign also arranged meetings with newspaper reporters, uh, editors, uh, arranged to be on the radio to create the impression of a big debate. And then once they would do that, then they would get reporters to write it up as if there was a debate. So here's a perfect example of how this worked. So a set of ads were run in Bowling Green, Kentucky, print and uh, television and radio advertisements. And then after all these ads are run, then they get the local newspaper to write an article, Bowling Green now battleground in heated global warming dispute. Now notice no actual scientists have gone to Bowling Green. No scientific meeting has taken place in Bowling Green. No actual scientific debate has taken place but it's now being written up in the newspaper as if it were a debate. I was going to show you a clip from a film that they produced called The Greening of Planet Earth that promoted this idea that carbon dioxide would be good for us because more plants would grow. Uh, the clip doesn't work, so we'll just move on. Okay, I, I do want to show you this other clip, though, um, from the film version of Merchants of Doubt, which features me, uh, because it explains and shows better than I can explain in words how this, what I call Potemkin Village science works. So let me um, get out of this for the moment. Uh, just do this. So sorry for the slight inconvenience, but it won't take long. Okay, so here I am now talking about how these groups issue reports that look as if they're scientific work, but they're not actually. So the film tells the story. This is Fred Singer. So the actual IPCC report is about so thick. And how thick is your NIPCC report? Same. Okay. Same. You're as thick as they are. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, and so just for, so for those of you who aren't familiar, so that's Fred Singer. Um, and so he's referring to the NIPCC, which is the non-governmental uh, panel on climate change. It's funded by the Heartland Institute, which is a right-wing think tank, heavily funded by the Coke Industries, uh, Philip Morris Tobacco, and other uh, corporate regulated corporations. Um, and as you see, you know they make them match. They even to be the exact same thickness. So, okay. So moving on. Let's close this up. Go back to our main event. Okay, why can't I get this slideshow? Here we go. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so we can keep on going here. Okay, and as we talked about in our work, one of the things we showed that it was that it wasn't just climate science. In fact, really the key to understanding this whole story and the strategy and tactics was, t was the recognition that the same set of strategies and tactics, the same organizations, and sometimes even the same people had been involved in challenging the science on a whole set of issues, including the risk of nuclear winter, the reality of acid rain, the reality of the ozone hole, the harms of DDT, and of course, climate change. In fact, just this morning, uh, someone was saying to me how someone he knows who's like a climate change denier was trying to tell him about how great DDT was and how they could have 
save millions of people in India if only we hadn't banned DDT. So some things that you would think have nothing to do with each other all get folded into this, uh, this anti-science campaign. So why? Why would these people challenge all the science? And what is the relationship between these seemingly different issues like climate change, DDT, and tobacco? Well, one part of the answer is obvious. The fossil fuel industry, like the tobacco industry, wanted to protect its business by denying the evidence of the serious harms caused by its product. So that's kind of obvious. And in our book, we didn't really stress that because we thought it was sufficiently obvious that we didn't really think our readers needed to be told that, although we got criticized by reviewers for not talking about that, proving that no matter what you do, you can't win. <laughs> but what we really wanted to look at and what I think in a way is most important, was most important for me as a historian of science, but I also think is most important for us as a scientific community, is to answer the question, but what about the scientists? What about the scientists who participated in this? Because they were crucial for giving credibility to claims which obviously would have been transparently self-serving. So why would distinguished scientists like Bill Nirenberg or Fred Seitz, Fred Seitz had been a president of the US National Academy of Sciences, Bob Jastrow had hired Jim Hansen at NASA. Why would these men reject the work of their own colleagues, even people that they had hired? Well, the best answer to that comes from the work of Fred Singer. Singer, like Bill Nirenberg and the others, was involved in campaigns to challenge the evidence of acid rain, global warming, and the ozone hole. And like the others, he also worked for the tobacco industry. In the early 1990s, he worked with the Philip Morris Company to attack the Environmental Protection Agency over the question of the harms of secondhand smoke. And there's a great little side story here. The tobacco industry spent a lot of time working with their PR firms trying to figure out what language to use to describe all the issues that they were confronting. And they decided they didn't like the term secondhand smoke because they reckoned Americans didn't like secondhand things. <laughs> So they promoted the idea of environmental tobacco smoke instead, which they thought sounded much more benign. But the only problem with that is it invited the scrutiny of the Environmental Protection Agency. And indeed, in the early 1990s, the EPA took up the question of whether or not environmental tobacco smoke represented a hazard, a health hazard, to the people who inhaled it. And they concluded that it did. In response to this, Fred Singer joined up with a lawyer named Kent Jeffries, and published a report attacking the EPA called EPA and the Science of Environmental Tobacco Smoke. The report was not published in a peer-reviewed scientific journal. It was published by a group called the Alexis de Tocqueville Institute, but the funding for it came entirely from the Tobacco Institute, which was the so-called research arm of the tobacco industry. Jeffries himself was a lawyer affiliated with the Cato Institute, who issued that uh, Potemkin Village Climate Report that you just saw, and the Competitive Enterprise Institute, which is an organization that fights regulation of industry. So the EPA had declared secondhand smoke to be a class A or proven carcinogen, that people who inhaled secondhand smoke developed cancer at much higher rates than people who were not exposed to secondhand smoke. They reviewed over 6,000 peer-reviewed studies. And this result, these results had been affirmed both by their own scientific advisory panels, by independent peer review panels, and by the US Surgeon General. The independent expert panel that was um, brought together by the EPA concluded in a review of the literature that secondhand smoke was responsible for 3,000 additional adult cancer deaths every year, and between 150 and 300,000 additional cases of bronchitis and pneumonia in infants and young children. They also concluded that there was strong statistical evidence for a correlation with sudden infant death syndrome. And this is a really interesting one because this finding was considered such a bombshell that it was actually suppressed in the report that was issued. And it was suppressed in part for a legitimate scientific reason, which was that the epidemiological data had trouble sorting out whether or not the sudden infant death syndrome was associated with environmental smoke in the household or whether it was associated with maternal smoking. But later follow-up studies showed that it was, in fact, directly correlated with secondhand smoke in the household. So even mothers who didn't smoke or were not exposed to secondhand smoke uh, during their pregnancy, if the children were exposed to it in the household, uh, they had much higher rates of sudden infant death syndrome. And this has been completely confirmed by later studies. And yet most American pediatricians still today don't even know that this is true. And when you have a child, and I can tell you from my own personal experience, anyone here who has children, m most pediatricians make a big point of telling parents 
They should put their children, their infants to bed on their back. There's a whole back to sleep campaign to prevent sudden infant death syndrome. Hardly anyone gets told by their pediatrician that you could kill your child with sudden infant death syndrome by smoking in the household. So, okay, so as I've said already, the evidence was supported by diverse independent peer-reviewed studies, over 6,000 peer-reviewed studies, but Singers and Jeffries challenged that science. And instead, they argued that the science was unsettled, claimed that experts disagreed, claimed that the EPA should have considered alternative hypotheses like a threshold effect, and most important, claimed that controlling secondhand smoke represented a threat to freedom. And this is really the crux of the argument why Fred Singer and Bill Nirenberg and Fred Seitz and Bob Jastrow undertook these campaigns, because they believed, as Singer explained, if we do not carefully delineate the government's role in regulating dangers, there's essentially no limit to how much government can ultimately control our lives. In short, they viewed this as a defense of freedom, and many letters and articles that they wrote to each other and to others hit this theme. Fred Singer, Bill Nuremberg, and their colleagues believed they were continuing the Cold War fight for freedom, that the same thing they had done in the Cold War to defend the United States against the communist threat was now being undertaken here at home by fighting against what they considered to be excessive environmental regulation. They feared that environmental and public health threats would be used to expand the reach of government, to limit our personal freedoms, and bring us communism by other means. And this explains a key part of how climate change denial grew, because these scientists then began to form alliances with industry who opposed regulation of their products for other reasons, and with think tanks like the Cato Institute that promoted free market political policies. So returning again to Singer and Jeffries, I've already pointed out that the report was published by the Alexis de Tocqueville Institute, co-written by a lawyer affiliated with Cato and Competitive Enterprise. But we can compile a list of a whole laundry list of think tanks, all of whom have been involved in climate change denial. And all of these groups, what they have in common is the defense of free market um, free market economics and free market policies. And so this is not even a complete list of all of the groups um, that we've identified, uh, but some of the more important ones. Every single one of these groups has defended the tobacco industry or challenged climate science ostensibly in the name of freedom. Now another way to think about this is to say, as many economists have said, that climate change is a market failure. It's a market failure because we don't pay the true cost of using fossil fuels. Nicholas Stern, the former chief economist of the World Bank, indeed, has called anthropogenic climate change the greatest and widest ranging market failure ever seen. And this, we've argued, is the common thread that unites the diverse science from DDT to tobacco to climate change that were challenged by the merchants of doubt. Because in every single one of these cases, scientists doing science not attempting to challenge the capitalist system, not attempting to make a political statement, but just scientists doing science discovered problems, discovered the problem of acid rain, discovered the problem of the ozone hole, discovered the fact that tobacco causes cancer and bronchitis and heart disease and emphysema and kidney cancer and a whole laundry list of other health effects. All of these being problems that seem to require some kind of government action to solve. And so various groups and individuals, diverse groups and individuals, who resisted such interventions for whatever reason, the companies that made the products, conservative think tanks and businessmen who promote free market policies, and old anti-communists made common cause to question, challenge, and ultimately fight the science. So where does that leave us today? And how should we as a community think about how should we think about what Bill Nuremberg did? I mean, we have a building named after him here, right? We have a prize about to be given this evening in his name. And yet we know he did all these troubling things. And it's not just Bill. It's all the scientists who participated. Not a lot of them. They're small in number, but they were large in impact. So this, then, is what I want to turn to for the final portion of my talk here, the question of the role of the scientist and the scientific community. So many scientists, particularly in the climate science community, have become concerned about this question. But it's not just us. Scientists involved in vaccinations, in evolutionary biology, in genetically modified crops. I mean, these questions come up in many different areas of science. What we face in climate science is not unique. 
we're not alone. And indeed, I think we might do well to begin to think more about talking to and working with colleagues on, you know, in other parts of campus who have faced similar kinds of challenges in other domains in order to think through how we as scientists can best respond. So I think we have a challenge because on the one hand, most scientists just want to do science. We became scientists because we love science, because we're good at science, um, because we are really interested in the natural world. I became a geologist because I thought rocks and minerals were incredibly cool and because I loved the incredible feeling you had when you looked at rocks that were a billion and a half years old and imagined the planet in which those rocks were formed. I didn't become a geologist so that I could fight, you know, to preserve the planet from dangerous anthropogenic interference, right? Um, and I don't think most of us did, although maybe some of the younger people in this room did, but most of us became scientists because we liked science and we were good at it. And that's where our talents lie. But at the same time, we've seen these challenges to our science. We've seen that if we don't respond, then the challenges go unchallenged. And so some scientists, like Jim Hansen, who we saw in the film, have publicly called, very publicly called, for scientists to be more outspoken and less reticent about what we know about climate change. The person who perhaps is most well known for the work he did in communicating climate science to the public is Steve Schneider, who died um, five, about five years ago. Steve was one of our most active and effective communicators. But he's often been quoted as climate skeptics and deniers as having said that climate scientists, quote, have to offer up scary scenarios, make simplified dramatic statements, and make little mention of any doubts we have. And this is sometimes taken as evidence, or it's claimed, that scientists have exaggerated the dangers of climate change and minimized the uncertainties for political reasons. Now, I think most of us would agree that if Steve had actually done that, if he had argued that we should make up scary scenarios and exaggerated claims, or advocated that anyone should do that, most of us would agree that that would be problematic. That as scientists, it's our job to explain the science accurately, fairly, and objectively with neither exaggeration nor underestimation. The ethos of science requires us to not to exaggerate and to be as clear as we can be about the relevant uncertainties. But what did Steve actually say? And I think this is really important because it also illustrates the problem of being taken out of context when you're trying to make sense of what is admittedly a complicated issue. So here's the actual quote, and it's long. And so this is one of the first lessons of climate communication, is that if you want your message to get through and not be taken out of context, you have to shorten it. Because <laughs> if you don't shorten it, someone else will, right? And we talked about this a lot in CNBC when I was here. Um, scientists complain a lot about being taken out of context or having their message being got wrong. And I think I've come to view that a lot of the reasons that happens is because we give very subtle, complicated, nuanced ex explanations, and they're too long for most journalists to assimilate. So the journalist is put in the situation of being forced to shorten it, and then they often shorten it in ways we don't like. So the lesson is, shorten it yourself <laughs> before someone else does it for you. OK, but here's what Steve really said. And it was in a book, and you know, in a book you think you ought to be able to like, not have to shorten everything. But anyway, here's the quote. On the one hand, as scientists, we are ethically bound to the scientific method, in effect promising to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but, which means we must include all the doubts, the caveats, the ifs, ands, and buts. On the other hand, like most people, we'd like to see the world a better place, which in this context translates into our working to reduce the risk of potentially disastrous climatic change. To do that, we need to capture the public's imagination. That, of course, entails getting loads of media coverage. So we have to offer up scary scenarios, make simplified dramatic statements, and make little mention of any doubts we might have. This double ethical bind we frequently find ourselves cannot be solved by any formula. Each of us has to decide what the right balance is between being effective and being honest. I hope that means being both. So he's actually asking us to think about how we can be honest about the science and also be effective. And he's saying that that's not always an easy thing to do, but he's encouraging us to try. So really, Steve was addressing what he had personally experienced as a challenge in communicating climate science, as well as acknowledging what all communication experts know. To get people's attention, you have to tell a compelling story. And that means you do need at least a little bit of drama, or at least a little bit of feeling. I gave a version of this talk at AGU a couple weeks ago, and I don't know if any of you were there, 
but I wore a red dress. And so at this point in the talk, I stopped and I said, and that's why I'm wearing a red dress today. And uh, afterwards, Matt Larson from the USGS, he says, I have a new slogan. It's going to be, wear the red dress. <laughs> but you know, when you speak in public, like the clothes you wear, all of the different things you do contribute to whether or not your message is received or not and how it's received. Um, you know, one of my mentors advised me a long time ago when I gave public lectures to wear high heels. You know, and a lot of feminists would consider that kind of retrograde, but I actually think she was right. Okay, and it's about, and some of it is about the drama, the drama of communication, right? The human drama of athletic competition, right? I mean, if there isn't some feeling, if there isn't some emotional force, most people will go to sleep, right? And as scientists, we're a little weird because like we can sit and listen to really boring talks and stay awake, but most people are not like that, right? <laughs> Actually, I think that was the moment in which I realized I was going to become a historian when I found that I actually couldn't stay awake in all those really boring scientific talks. But, okay. So the point is that this feeds into the claims of climate skeptics and deniers who assert that we've been alarmist, that we've exaggerated the risks, and if we're women, that we've been hysterical. So I just want to give you one more little piece of um, work that I've done and then move on to the conclusion. So a couple of years ago, I decided to take this up as a scientific question. That is to say, the deniers and contrarians were saying that we were all alarmist, hysterical, that we'd exaggerated the threat. And I thought, well, we can test that claim. We can ask the question, have we been alarmist? Have we exaggerated the threats? Or maybe have we actually underestimated the threat? And what we found was that the answer was no, that overall climate scientists have not exaggerated the threat. And in fact, there's actually evidence that if anything, we've tended to underestimate the threat and understate the case. So what we did, my colleagues and I um, went through the peer-reviewed literature and found all of the articles and reports that we could find, peer-reviewed literature, that predicted key climate change parameters, including temperature, CO2, sea level rise, and sea ice loss, starting in the late 1980s, since the creation of the IPCC. And then we compared the predictions in those reports to what had actually happened, as reported in the um, most recent IPCC reports. And what we found was that overall, climate scientists ac have actually been either quite accurate in their predictions or underestimated the outcomes. That is to say, we actually found an asymmetry that leaned in the direction of underestimation, not overestimation. So we wanted to explain a little bit about why maybe this had happened. And so we also followed up the analysis of the literature with interviews with scientists. And what we found was that in our interviews, scientists very strongly stressed the importance of avoiding being wrong. But their comments made it clear that they were particularly worried about being wrong in a particular manner. They were much more worried about overpredicting and overstating the threat than they were worried about understating or underpredicting. And that's kind of interesting when you think about it, because if our work is completely objective, we should expect that the errors would fall both above and below the actual values of any parameter. And if they fall more one side than the other, then that's evidence of some kind of bias in the work. So what we're really finding is that actually our work is biased in the direction of underestimation. And maybe part of the reason it's biased that way is because we're actually overly concerned with overprediction. And so then the question becomes, well, why? I would argue that this is a bit of a strange result epistemically, because if our goal is truth, if our goal is accuracy, if our goal is to be correct, then we should seek neither to over nor under predict. And scientists should not say, oh, I'm more worried about overstating the case. Scientists should say, I want to get the answer right. But it's not what people actually said. It's also strange socially, because if our goal is to warn society of a real threat and prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference, if we believe that that is a real problem, then we'd actually be better off from a social perspective in overstating in order to ensure action. And I think this is what Steve was trying to say when he said about the scary scenarios. He's saying we need to wake people up. We need people to understand that there is a real threat that in the worst case is, in fact, actually quite scary. And when the social costs of inaction are high, it may be better to cry wolf than to fiddle while Rome burns, or in this case, while Greenland melts. So why have we underestimated the threat? Well, in our work, we argue that part of this comes from science as a culture of reason. Our conclusions are based on the rational evaluation of evidence, and this is something to be proud of, to nurture and protect. But the problem is that we wrongly equate rationality with dispassion. 
And these are actually two different things. But because we are afraid of emotion and we associate emotion with irrationality, we shy away from scary, alarming, and dramatic outcomes, even when they might be true. And we call this erring on the side of least drama. We think that sounding upset, alarmed, angry, or emotional would discredit our message because it would suggest that we're not evaluating matters calmly in the so-called cold light of reason. And as we all know, emotions are hot and reason is cold. Now, Steve Schneider recognized that this culture of rationality may interfere with the demands of effective communication, but what our work shows is that it may interfere with the demands of accuracy as well. It causes us to fall prey to erring on the side of least drama and on the side of underestimation. In other words, it causes us to err scientifically. Um, we've done some additional work on what we call seepage, the adverse effects of a contrarian social context. Um, I'm going to skip that in the interest of time and just um, move on to the basic conclusion of the paper. OK, so. Uh, this seems weird, but I'm going to keep going. OK. So one of the things that's been difficult and challenging for climate scientists is that we've been operating in a hostile climate in which many of us, many of our colleagues, myself included, have been subject to attacks, sometimes highly personal, sometimes highly vicious, and highly misrepresentative attacks in the mass media. And it can be very hard to know how to respond to these attacks, because when you're accused of saying things you didn't say, you sometimes feel like, well, I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to do other than say what I said and maybe say it again. Um, so those of us who've experienced these attacks know it's very hard to know how to respond. And often it feels that in order to respond, one has to be aggressive. But as a scientist, that doesn't feel right. And it doesn't feel right in part because, as Ben Santer said to me when I was interviewing him for our book, we want the facts to speak for themselves. Most of us were raised to believe that facts should speak for themselves. But the evidence is that they don't. Or I would even say that it's a fact that facts don't speak for themselves. <laughs> experts have to speak for them. And when it comes to climate, we are the experts. And therefore, we need to speak. So I do think, and I agree with Steve Schneider, that we do have to speak up. And we have to be spokespeople for our own science. We have to explain the science that we have done. Because if we don't, there really isn't anyone else to do it for us or the people who will try will generally not do a very good job, and they may deliberately misrepresent it. So there isn't anyone more qualified to explain our science than us. But I also have a caveat that I want to insert into this discussion. There are many things about which climate scientists are not experts, and therefore not particularly qualified to speak about. And that includes many details of policy. It's my view that we can say and it falls out logically from our science and our expertise that we must do something to control greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere if we are to prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference in the climate system. This is a conclusion that falls out directly from our science, just as tobacco control scientists did not hesitate to say that because the scientific evidence showed that tobacco was killing people, that something needed to be done to communicate that to people and to discourage people from smoking. But we cannot judge, as scientific experts, whether it is better to have a carbon tax or an emissions trading system, or if the former, should we achieve revenue neutrality through fee and dividend or cut taxes elsewhere. These are matters of social science and politics and economics about which most of us are quite inexpert. If we want to be public spokesmen and women on these issues, we can, but then we need to develop expertise. And it's interesting to me that when Steve Schneider, in the latter part of his life, began to conclude that many of the issues surrounding climate science were fundamentally economic, he began to work with an economist at Stanford, uh, Larry Goulder. He actually took economics classes, went back to school, became a student again, and began to publish articles in peer-reviewed journals with Professor Goulder. So he developed the expertise and worked with colleagues in order to be able to speak in an informed way about some of the economic aspects of climate science. So my view is that we should not be reticent about defending our work in public, 
but we should be reticent about talking outside our expertise. And we should respect the expertise of others who are experts in those domain. But as I've already said, we should not be reticent about talking about the things we know and understand, the things we know, or have every reason to believe at least, are true. And we should not be reticent about calling out others who say things that we know to be untrue. When it comes to the facts about our climate, about our Earth in general, someone has to speak for the facts, and that someone is us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Naomi. I'm going to let you entertain questions. So okay. We're not swapping back and forth on the microphone. I'm sure we have time for just a few. Okay. All right. Yes. Hi. So it seems like there are some circumstances where there might be benefit to working directly with industry. So a great example I can think of would be working directly with fishermen to collect data. There's a lot of benefit on both sides that tend to end up with better policy outcomes as mm -hmm. well as potentially better data. Um, I'm curious, kind of as a scientist, if we're approached with those kinds of collaborations, where's that line between working with them and becoming one of those scientists? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, all slippery slope arguments on some level are false, right? Because life is a slippery slope. And so, you know, we, ha we always have to sort out questions that, about activities that taken to some extreme could be unacceptable, right? But it doesn't mean that there aren't places you can be that are perfectly legitimate. So there's a long history in this country of outstanding scientific research supported by industry. This is not an argument against industry-funded science. My own PhD work was funded by a mining company. Um, but I think that if you work with industry, you have to be mindful of two things. The first one is disclosure. You have to disclose your funding sources, right? That's an absolute, in my opinion. And I don't think there's any, I have, know of no situation, I've never been presented by any colleague with any situation that I think justifies hiding the sources of your funding. So we need to be clear. If you're working with the oil and gas industry or fish, the fishing industry or the fossil fuel industry, that's fine. But let everyone know so that people can judge for themselves whether or not they think there could be a potential conflict of interest. And that's the second part. And, that, and the reason we need disclosure is because of the risk of conflict of interest. One of the things we know from scientific research is that scientists are very um, cavalier about the threat of conflict of interest. And a lot of scientists think, and there's a very interesting report that was done. Um, I wrote a piece about six months ago that was published in ESNT on this, so you can look it up if you're interested. So surveys show that if you ask scientists, um, if you accept money from the, this was particularly focused on pharmaceuticals, but it's applicable in other areas. If you accept money from the pharmaceutical industry, do you think that that would bias your work in any way? And scientists say, no, of course not. And then you ask the question, if a colleague accepted money, do you think, and then they say, yes. <laughs> So psychologists have a name for this. It's called the third party effect, and we're all prone to it. We think that other people are more prone to bias and subjectivity than we are. And scientists are actually worse about this than average people because we think we're not. And so because we think we're not, it actually makes us in a way more vulnerable because we don't think we have to take precautions. So, so what we need, in a sense, is to do what you just did, is to be aware of it and say, look, is there a potential for conflict of interest and how? Is there a particular outcome that my funder wants that could influence how I'm viewing this? And then there are certain kinds of precautions that can be taken. For example, I think that in addition to a disclosure of all funding sources, I think that universities should forbid uh, non-disclosure agreements or non-publication agreements. So one of the things we know the pharmaceutical industry does is that they will fund studies in which they have scientists will uh, do agreements that say, you can't publish this unless the company agrees. And if the results are adverse to the product, the company will not allow publication. I think that's completely unacceptable, and I think that it should be banned in all universities. If you accept funding, it's got to be on the basis of absolute transparency about funding sources and an absolute right to publish the results and let the chips fall where they fall intellectually. And I think if those safeguards are in place, then I think in most cases you can accept funding um, without too much anxiety. Now, the one exception I make for that is the tobacco industry. And this has come up as an issue on a lot of campuses, whether we should accept funding for research by the tobacco industry. My view is no, because the tobacco industry is a criminal enterprise. 
and they have been convicted of criminal behavior by the US Department of Justice. And I think that's a bright line, and I think that's a bright line we should respect. We should not be accepting, we wouldn't accept money from the mafia or organized crime. We should not accept money from any industry that has been convicted of fraudulent behavior. And so that would be the asbestos industry, although they're mostly bankrupt and don't really exist anymore, the tobacco industry, and any other industry that would be convicted of fraudulent activity. Then I think you have to say, no, we can't cooperate with people who commit fraud. Well, that's antitrust. I think that's a little different. I mean, uh, yeah, OK, well, we'll, that, uh, this, we'll s separate that for another day. But I'm thinking about like fraudulent behavior with respect to scientific information, right? Volkswagen? Yeah, well, Volkswagen, I think, is a serious one. <laughs> yeah. They haven't been convicted yet, but they're going to be. <laughs> I really like what you said about being reticent in areas that are not in our own expertise. But I personally had this struggle with mm. economists who say mm. that you know, the discount rate is 3%. And so we do not give a rat's ass about our grandchildren. Yeah. And I say, that's got to be wrong. I'm not an economist, but right. that's got to be wrong. Right. What do you do? Yeah, no, that's a great question, Jeff. And I think that this is why, again, like there aren't really bright lines, and this is why we need to have this conversation. So I think in that case, there's a few different things you can do. And I think one thing you can do is say, well, there's a moral component here, right? And this is what the Pope did in the encyclical. And I think that document is a great resource for all of us. And if you haven't read it, you absolutely have to, and you don't have to read the edition that I wrote the introduction to. Um, <laughs> but because they're, they're leaving out the moral dimension. And so what you can say is, that's fine, and I understand that discount rates are an important part of economic accounting, but there's a moral dimension that needs to be included in this discussion. Right? And you can always point out, it's like any modeling enterprise. right? If you have a colleague building a climate model and they've left out some component that you think is significant, None of us would have to say, well, your model leaves out the clouds. Your model treats the ocean like a wet blanket. So you can say to economists, well, so if I had had more time, I would have talked about. So when Dave worked on that PSAC report, I mean, one of the arguments I wanted to make about that is to say, Dave and Roger Revelle were not reticent, right? They didn't think that they had to be shy about saying to the president, hey, president, we think we have a big problem. But what I, meant, what I, what I wanted to say was that um, they were polar opposites in personality. Dave was a pretty retiring kind of person. Steve was very outgoing, very extroverted. Um, but Steve actually found a greater challenge in communicating climate science than, say, Dave did. And I think that has to do with the social context. So the other part of the story is how the social context of science has really changed in America in the last 50 years. We work in a much more hostile and adverse environment than, say, Roger Revelle did in the 60s. And that's affected all of us. And so that means we actually have to think about that. We have to think about the social and political context and how it affects both the work that we do and the way we communicate it. Yeah. Um, I'm a non-scientist, so I'll, I'll make that apology. You don't have to apologize. I, I, <laughs> Thanks for being here. I want to ask a question, a, a fascinating lecture that you had. My question is, um, going beyond uh, individual action, when you look at the imbalance between the deniers and the opposition on any of these issues, incredibly well-funded, members of large organizations, willing to use any kind of technique. Um, when you look at the other side of individual scientists or universities that have to operate within certain parameters or NGOs that may be risk-averse on advocacy, I don't see, as someone who's built a number of companies, where the balance is going to come from other than courageous, brilliant scientists and those who get trained in communications, which several of us are supporting, but there's still a great power imbalance. So my question is, as you look around institutionally, and I could name organizations, whether it's Union of Concerned Scientists or others, how do you see institutionally that this imbalance can start to be balanced? Because the power, the money, and the techniques are over here with these well-organized groups and rational scientific voices, courageous as they may be, have a different set of metrics and parameters. So what are some options that you've seen through your work? Yeah, that's a really great question. And you're absolutely right in your summary there. So I think a couple of things. Um, there's a huge imbalance. And it, your question reminds me of a few years ago when I first started to talk about this. I gave a talk at AGU, and I followed Jane Lopchenko who most of you know. And Jane gave this wonderful, very reassuring, feel-good talk about the Aldo Leopold program that she had helped develop to train mostly biologists in communications. And, um, 
And then I gave up, got up and I said, okay, so Jane just gave you the feel good talk, now I'm gonna give you the feel bad talk. Um, and so I talked about Fred Seitz and the work that he did with the tobacco industry, and I asked Jane, I said, how much money do you have for the Aldo Leopold program? At the time it was a million dollars a year, and she was thinking that was pretty good, you know, a million dollars for science communication. Frederick Seitz had $45 million in 1979 to undermine science. <laughs> and that was in 1979, so you could do the math and turn that into current day dollars. So it's a huge imbalance and un unlevel playing field. So I think your question also suggests part of the answer. I mean, we desperately need people like yourself, people in the business community to support training for scientists in climate communication. And I think, um, or whoever's going to do it, um, but I also think that, and I don't think that every scientist has to be out, you know, communicating, but I think many scientists need to do it. And I think that part of the way the balance can be redressed is to say, look, the reality was even though, like, Bill Nierenberg and Fred Seitz got a lot of money from the tobacco industry and the fossil fuel industry, they were actually only a handful of people, and they were effective in part because they were very well funded, and they were also very media savvy, but if, if hundreds of climate scientists had stepped up to the plate and spoke up against them, that would have helped. But it didn't happen because at the time, nobody, I don't think the scientific community really understood what was going on. Now we do understand, so now we don't really have an excuse. So my view is that we should have communication training on all university campuses across America. I'm not saying they have to be mandatory because I don't think we want to get into some kind of like Stalinist re-education thing. But you know, that any scientist who wants to do it or to be enabled and empowered and supported to do it. And that turns out actually to be a lot of scientists, not all, but a lot of scientists want to. And the key thing I think is really what you said about courage. I think that up until now, it's taken courageous people like Steve Steiner or Jim Hansen, but I don't think you should have to be courageous. And I don't think you should have to risk your scientific career. It ought to be sort of routine. It ought to be something that any of us could spend, you know, a day a month or even just the occasional letter to the editor doing because we know how to do it and it's not a big deal and we just accept it as part of our jobs and part of our lives. And that means there's one other thing we need to do that Ray Weiss and I were talking about earlier. We have to be nicer to each other <laughs> because one of the bad things that happens, and a lot of you know, which is why some people are laughing, in the scientific community, if a scientist does try to communicate and talk, a lot of times we get slapped down by our colleagues who say, oh, you oversimplified you know, the ice dynamics of the East Antarctic ice sheet, right? Or, sorry, I use East, so I wouldn't be like picking on Jeff. But, you know, or, you know, oh, you're, you know, you left out, what was it, the halogenated sulfur, you know, I mean, it's like you left out some detail, and you get all this, you know, crap from colleagues. I've had this experience, like I spend hours crafting a public talk or writing up it, and then I'll get 15 emails from colleagues saying, you know, well, I mean, usually they're not like mean. They're usually like, well, that was good, but, you know, and then there's like this laundry list of the things you left out, right? And, and honestly, I don't really mind because if I've left something, I'll actually like it when my scientific colleagues like tell me because then I, I learn from that. But, but I've seen it done in nasty and mean ways to people. And I've certainly heard lots of colleagues saying they don't feel they can speak up because they feel that they'll be criticized by their colleagues if they do. So I think we all have to relax <laughs> and chill out and, and be nice to each other and be supportive and recognize that, I mean, there's a right way and a wrong way to do that too, right? If I say something in public that's not quite right, you can send me an email and say, oh no, I just want to like let you know, here's a little thing about the climate forcing that you didn't get quite right. And that's totally fine and that's supportive and constructive. But not to be nasty about it, not to be mean, and not to criticize colleagues. You know, one thing that's weird about Steve Schneider's life is that he's this, like, God now, and we have all these prizes named after him, and everybody goes on and on about how terrific and great and wonderful he was. But in his lifetime, those of us who knew him knew, he got a lot of grief from colleagues who criticized him for going on television, being on The Tonight Show, accused him of being egotistical, narcissistic. And, you know, maybe he was egotistical and narcissistic, but he did a lot of good, right? And so I think it's really important for us to focus on the good that people who are effective communicators can do and support them and empower them and thank them for doing that work, which honestly helps us all. One last question. So what do you think are the prospects for legislative action to combat climate change? Because we know that America is, like, we need serious climate legislation. And the Republicans, I, I think that in their broader parts, they do know what's going on at this point. Yeah. So what are the prospects for this happening? 
Well, I'm not a clairvoyant, and I'm not a political scientist, and I've just made a point about not like going outside my own expertise. So I'll speak as a historian. I think that one of the mistakes that we sometimes make as scientists is we focus too much on the federal government. And I've thought a lot about why we do that, and I think we do it because for the last 50 years, the federal government has been the most important patron of basic science in this country. So we look to the federal government as the place, and we also look to it as the place where we expect the science policy interface to take place. And in Roger Revelle's era, that was what happened. But I think that right now, the most interesting political action is happening on the state and local level. And so I think if you want to become involved politically, right now, at this moment in history, the action is on the state level. So here in California, you know, supporting the really important initiatives that are going on in California and educating the rest of the country about it. Because I've traveled this whole country, and I can tell you, most people outside of California have no idea what AB 32 is. <coughs> Right? And I spend a lot of time telling people about it because when people hear that California is leading and has passed legislation and they've done it by bipartisan uh, majorities and it was supported by both you know, our current governor and previous Republican governor, that moves people. And, and it's not just California, right? Like most Americans have no idea that British Columbia has a carbon tax. And if you tell people about that and you explain how it worked and how it was brought in by a conservative government, that moves people. Right now in Massachusetts, we've got legislation pending for carbon pricing. So there's a lot of interesting things going on on the level of states and provinces. <coughs> Alberta has just voted to have a carbon tax. And just pause for that. Alberta, right? How amazing is that? I mean, if Alberta can have a carbon tax, that means anyone can have a carbon tax, right? <laughs> so we should all be talking about Alberta. You know, we should be out there in public. We should educate ourselves about the Alberta situation, we should educate ourselves about the BC experience, and we should be talking to people about that and telling people maybe the federal government is frozen right now, but that doesn't mean we can't act on the state level. Great. Thank you.